Okay, so we'll take the top off, we'll add a match. The barking dog experiment was one of the most famous experiments and favourite experiments that was done by my former colleague, Colonel B.D. Shaw. So Neil, so I'm preparing for one of our favourite reactions, it's called the barking dog reaction. This is a reaction which actually makes an element and we're going to make some sulphur today. So the reaction's quite, quite cool. In the barking dog experiment, you have a mixture of the molecule carbon disulfide, CS2. It's just like um, carbon dioxide, but... Um, wait a minute, I will... So this is a, a test tube, a rather large test tube, of laughing gas, N2O, and we're going to use that to make some sulphur. So I have a model here. Um, so it's CS2, which has a carbon in the middle and sulphurs at either end. So it looks just like in the model as a molecule of CO2, but it has sulphur there and there. And this molecule, CS2, will react with laughing gas, N2O. So where are we going to do this, then? In the dark somewhere. So essentially, you're just using the laughing gas as a um, source of oxygen to burn this molecule. Well, the reaction that we're going to do generates a lot of light. It used to be used as a, as a flash for, for cameras and for photography. What happens is you get a very bright emission of a sort of <clears throat> bluish purple light, which in the old days was used for um, taking photographs. Before people had flash lamps on their cameras, they would set this off and it would <clears throat> give a great flash of light, which could be used to take photographs. But because it's much slower than the flash, it makes people really have quite a surprised look. And this may well be by an old way in old photographs, people look so surprised because, my God, this thing has gone off. Whoosh! So we're on the hunt for a very dark place. In the tube, as the reaction takes place, it generates heat. OK, so we'll come into the small lecture theatre, which is vacant now. It's quite nice because we can turn all the lights off and make it a bit darker so you can see this reaction in its sort of best. So we've, we've managed to, to create a darker environment so we can really see the, the benefits from this chemistry. And Neil's put some water in the bottom of the tube and we're going to put about 6 to 8 millilitres of carbon disulfide into this tube and a good mix so you can ensure that we get all of that carbon disulfide going into the vapour phase so it'll react really quite quickly with that oxidant, the N2O. As the flame goes down the tube, it accelerates because the reaction is going faster and faster, so it gives this great sort of whoop noise. Now then, that was a really, really energetic reaction because the organic and the, the oxidant are all in the same phase and the, the reaction got a lot faster and the noise it made went a lot, lot louder as it went down because of pressure. So what you can see in the tube here is actually the result or the, the aim of our chemical reaction today because we wanted to make some sulphur. So what we've got here, coated on the inside of this tube, is a thin layer of polymeric sulphur. So you can see all this really quite nice sulphur coating the side of the glass flask itself. Now I'm really fortunate because I'm just going to go back to my office and prepare a lecture and leave Neil to clean this. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <Big test tube. laughs> We'll just, studio, we? yeah. What are you doing, mate? Well, um, I've just filled up um, my vessel with some oxygen. So this is liquid oxygen, which we made for an earlier demonstration. And uh, we've just used it to, to drive off all of the non-combustible nitrogen from inside this glass vessel. Well, look at all that oxygen floating around the bottom of that flask. That's really cool. All oscillating and... A really nice experiment. Okay. Yeah, this is a, it's a really quite crazy jar. It's a small amount of sulphur or sulphur that we've decanted out. And, and unfortunately, when we decanted it out, we, we spelt the name wrong. So, Who's responsible for that? And it's a, a, a very old friend of mine, and I couldn't possibly give you his identity because he'd be really, really angry, wouldn't he, Neil? No, I'm saying nothing. And it wasn't, and it wasn't Neil. It wasn't me. Well, so, usually. So here we've got a small amount of sulphur that we're going to put on the, the tip of this spoon. So you can see it's starting to melt over the top. 
so it's on fire and then we'll just drop it into the flask and you can see that that sulfur is burning really intensely now with a really quite beautiful flame it's generating a lot of SO2 really smelly which is why we're doing it inside this fume hood but you can see the really rich intense blue flame as that that sulfur is burning in that excess oxygen atmosphere okay so this is actually a sort of geological sample of sulfur uh, so you can see it's actually um, ooh, <coughs> on the bottom we've actually got what well, got a rock and the sulfur crystals have actually formed on top of it um, so actually sulfur does occur naturally. Um, I think it's been known since ancient times, um, you know, when sermons are delivered with fire and brimstones because uh, the hell is supposed to smell like sulfur, which is brimstone. Uh, but actually sulfur itself um, doesn't actually smell. But what, what you're smelling, the sulfury smell, is actually sort of, sort of oxidised material and hydrogen sulphide. Well, it's actually a mixture of sulfur and sand that was picked up on, by one of my colleagues on his honeymoon. You see, he was thinking about chemistry even on his honeymoon, though I don't think he told his wife that. I have a feeling, but I could be wrong, that this actually, I bought this sample in, in Oxfordshire, where, where I used to live, um, and I think it's actually from Brazil. But I could be wrong. So as we're using up all the sulphur now, the flame will die down until it'll eventually go out. Cool, there you go.